couple of quick things before we start. Uh, first off, your second response paper is due tomorrow. I am going to send everybody um, a kind of model of an A response paper, uh, but I am waiting. Um, I've contacted a couple of students who have written good ones in the past, and I don't want to send their work to you. Like, I take their names off it, right? But like, I don't want to send their work to other students without their permission. So I'm just waiting on permission to give you a sample, and then you'll have one to work from, right? Um, okay, uh, other things. Uh, we're going to be continuing uh, reading about the slave trade and abolition for next time, right? So you're going to be reading the excerpts from the autobiographies of Oluda Equiano and Mary Prince. Uh, for next time, right? So we're today we have been looking at the, we're going to be looking at the work of white abolitionists and one pro-slavery advocate. Um, <clears throat> next time we are going to be looking at uh, Black Britons uh, in their own words, right? Um, and we're going to find that some themes are consistent between the two, but in other ways the approach is actually quite different. Um, now, uh, does anybody have any questions about anything that's coming up or anything that's due before we get started? Yes, Kyla. Is that response paper due tomorrow? Yes, there's a response paper due to, second response paper is due tomorrow, yep. What is it on again? Um, anything that we read this week. Oh. Yes. So the test that we have, it be on what we read for Monday, or does it be what we read from the past week? Um, the reading quizzes will always be before the class on that particular topic, right? So if I'm going to give you a quiz on Equiano and Prince, then it will appear in Georgia View on Monday night, right? It will appear at 8 p.m. Monday night. It will close at 10.30 Tuesday morning. And you will have from once you open it, you'll have 12 minutes to finish it. Yes. From the last response paper, like for say, like you, we did it. Um, will you like give us like feedback on those? I already did. You did? Yep. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's already posted. Not the grade. I'm just saying, like what you thought was missing. Yeah. No. It, it, it yeah. It, it is already posted um, in Georgia View. You should be able to see it. Okay. Because I was only able to see the grade I didn't really need. Okay, yeah, there, yeah there, there, there should be, a, when, when you go in to look at the assignment, there should be feedback there posted that you should be able to read. Oh. And if for whatever reason there isn't, let me know because it means something went wrong. But I, I definitely posted feedback. Um, any other questions about anything? So for the response paper due, I know we're taking out something from the waiting this week, but... Uh, I'm not sure how the whole process works. Do we read for it? I mean, I see we have a quiz on Monday and then a response paper due on Friday. So for the quiz reading we do for Monday, I just want to know how the process works. Do we read beforehand okay. and then go and do, uh, do that in class? Or okay, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, the, the idea behind the quizzes is to hold you responsible for the reading, not to hold you responsible for coming to class, right? So if there's a quiz on something, it will always be before, you'll always have to take it before you come to class to talk about that thing, right? So if, if I give you, and I'm not saying I'm going to, right? You'll, um, you'll need to keep an eye on the Georgia View page. But if I do give you a quiz on Equiano Prince, then it'll appear Monday before we talk about these in class, right? So the whole idea is to try to get you to read, the, read them closely before you come to class to talk about them, right? Let me talk about that in class and then you're on the paper on it. Yes, and the response paper is just, uh, can be on anything that we talked about during that week, right? So if you wanted to write a, re so this week's response paper would be about either anything we talked about last time or what we're talking about today. Any other questions? Okay, then let's start by connecting history to current events.
Come on. There we go. And we wait. So as this image sort of comes into focus here, um, what we have here up on the project on the screen is a statue of a late 17th, early 18th century merchant and philanthropist in the city of Bristol. which is a prominent seaport in the south of England by the name of Edward Colston. Did anybody see anything in the news over the past couple months about this particular statue? Is anybody familiar with what I'm talking about here or know where I'm going to go? Kyla? I want to say yeah. Did they recently take that down or no? That wasn't that one? No. Yeah, th th this, this was a statue that was taken down not by the local government, but by, uh, by, by, but by protesters okay. and tossed into the harbor. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, for a couple of days, if you looked for the Edward Colston statue on Google Maps, it showed it in the middle of the harbor rather than on its, on its usual plinth. Now, does anybody know why protesters took this statue down and threw it in the harbor? Yeah, go ahead, uh, Alex. Uh, I'm not just was he a slave owner? He was not a slave owner, but he was a slave trader. Okay. Yeah, Colston was, was one of the wealthiest and most prominent citizens of Bristol at the end of the 17th century. And he made most of his money through shares in what was called the Royal Africa Company. And among the British upper middle classes and aristocracy, um, participation in the Royal Africa Company's, uh, financial participation in the Royal Africa Company was pretty deeply pervasive. Um, in addition to prominent merchants like Colston, um, big investors in the Royal Africa Company included the royal family, and the missionary branch of the Anglican Church. Which also owned significant interests in several slave plantations in the West Indies. So slave trading was very much tied up um, with basically all of the upper levels of society here, right? Um, it was tied up, the merchant class was tied up in it, the aristocracy, and even the church. So one thing that we will see about white abolitionists in Britain during this period is that they tend to come from what are called the dissenting religions, or the dissenting sects, right? So the dissenters were groups of Protestant Christians who were not part of the Anglican Church, right? They had rejected the Anglican Church and formed sects of their own. So this included groups like the Quakers, Methodists, Presbyterians in Scotland, basically any Protestant group that 
was that it broke, that split off from the main body of the Anglican Church, right? that didn't follow the official state religion. So, <clears throat> Colston is just kind of the, Colston is just one example of the ways in which official Britain profited from the slave trade. Um, how many of you have ever heard of Bar uh, Barclays Bank? Okay, yeah, even lately, you know, there's the, the Barclays Center in New York City where the Brooklyn Nets play, right? It's, you know, named for and funded by this particular bank. Now, it was founded by the Barclay brothers at the end of the 18th century, beginning of the 19th century. And they founded the bank based on money they had made in the slave trade once the slave trade was officially abolished in 1807. So even these contemporary, could you, I'm sorry, could you pull your mask up please? Thank you. These contemporary economic pillars of British society are built on this foundation of money made from slave trading, right? So, I want to point out to you as well, um, like one of the ways in which some of the some cities in Britain are dealing uh, with their legacy as uh, slave trading ports um, is with information. There's a really good museum in Liverpool, right? So Liverpool is today best known for being the home of what or who? Who came from Liverpool? Maybe this is something that is not translated to your generation. <laughs> most, uh, most famous British band of the 60s? Yeah, is it, yeah, Liverpool was where the Beatles were from, right? So that's what Liverpool was most famous for post about post 1962, right? Prior to that, it was most famous for shipbuilding and as an important slave trading port, right? Most of the port cities in Britain are implicated in the trade in various ways. And so in Liverpool there is actually a really good International Slavery Museum, um, and you know, even like, okay, we can't go to England right now to visit this museum, right? But they have a lot of really good informational resources. If you click on the About section, um, you know, there's a great section in particular here on the history of slavery that you can um, click through Right, there's a section here you know, on history, there's a section on archaeology, um, they have a list of other resources you can go to to get more information. Right, it is a really good resource uh, for background info generally. So, <clears throat> historical question here. In how many of the original 13 U.S. colonies was slavery initially legal? The answer is actually not eight. It's more. Oh, I was going to say less. I was going to say less. <laughs> Slavery was initially legal at time of founding in all of the original 13 U.S. colonies. With the exception of Georgia where it was legalized later. Georgia was founded as a debtor's colony and so <clears throat> General Oglethorpe who founded the colony didn't want these uh, you know, debtors he was bringing over from Britain trying to work off uh, their prison sentences uh, using bonded labor to do the work for them. Once General Oglethorpe died, 
slavery became legal because the colonists wanted it. But yeah, this is a common misconception about American history is that slavery was only legal in the South. And indeed, like in most of the northern colonies, slavery was legal a lot longer than you'd think it would have been, right? So for example, in my home state of Pennsylvania, slavery wasn't abolished until 1804. In New Jersey, it wasn't abolished until the 1830s. In Massachusetts, it was not officially abolished until 18, 1865, when it was abolished throughout the country. But that was largely because it was kind of a moot point there, because census records show that after about 1780, there weren't any enslaved people living in Massachusetts. So they just never bothered to pass a law, because it just didn't, at least as far as anyone knows, there don't seem to have been any slaves in the, in the, slave, uh, slaves in the state at that time. Um, and things kind of worked in a similar way in Britain. So the slave trade is abolished in Britain earlier than it is in the US, right? It's abolished in 1807 by Act of Parliament. But there's a period of what the government called apprenticeship attached to it. So they can't import any new slaves into British colonies or into Britain itself after 1807. But people who are already enslaved are not given their freedom. Rather, they are apprenticed to their masters to be released at a later date, which keeps getting put off and put off and put off until fear of insurrection around 1832 leads to emancipation as part of a larger government reform bill, right? There's a huge government reform bill in 1832. We'll probably end up talking more about that in more detail later. But for our purposes right now, what matters is this is the bill that granted emancipation. Now, emancipation, once again, as we know from the American experience, did not mean equality, right? So people were no longer enslaved. And the British also found other ways to get cheap or free labor, um, in particular in the West Indies, by importing uh, workers from the lower socioeconomic, socioeconomic classes of South Asia into the West Indies. Um, they managed to replace the labor force they lost through emancipation. Um, and, you know, one that they could also kind of keep under their heel. But, you know, this is a system that persisted from the 16th century into the beginning of the 19th century the traces of which, the effects of which, um, are still evident um, in British society. Um, particularly in the, and we'll, we'll be coming back to this stuff at the end of the semester when we talk about immigrant literature. Um, in particular, uh, on the West Indian psyche. Now the music I was playing at the beginning of uh, class uh, was a slave chant from Barbados from the late 18th century, right? And this was actually, this, this is a, a chant that was unearthed only fairly recently by a musicologist by the name of Roger Gibbs, uh, who had been going through uh, the, ar the archives of the Gloucestershire County Council and found in the papers of an abolitionist named Granville Sharp the music and the words um, for this particular chant. And right, so normally, so we just heard the vocal part of the chant, right? Normally, this would be accompanied by the sounds of work, right? Of, you know, cutting and milling sugarcane. And cutting and milling sugarcane, right, was really kind of at the center of uh, the British slave enterprise in the West Indies, right? So I've already, we've already noted, right, that to the British, the West Indies were actually more valuable colonies than the American colonies, right? 
they got more economically from the West Indies than any place else, largely because of the European appetite for sugar. And you would see on sugar plantations not only incredibly harsh living conditions, but pretty horrific working conditions. So once the sugar cane was cut, it had to be milled. And it had to be milled in teams, largely because um, the worker who was doing the milling would often get his or her hands caught in the mill. And so another worker usually had to stand by with a machete to cut that person's arm off if it got caught in the works. So it was not uncommon to see slaves on these plantations who were missing limbs because the, you know, the getting caught in the works happened with so much frequency, right? And we'll see similar things happening when we look at the Industrial Revolution in a couple of weeks, uh, particularly to child workers and to women. Um, <clears throat> people frequently got caught in the machines and maimed or killed, right? So much of the prosperity that people like Coleridge are noting in their arguments against slavery is built on this particular system in which you know, slaves are regularly being, you know, not just punished for you know, not meeting work quotas or for trying to escape, but are also regularly being maimed, right? So does any of, do any of you know how the transatlantic triangle worked, what this looked like, what, what this was? Yeah, sort of. Yeah, this this was sort of how the, the the movements of trade goods, right, between parts of British the spheres of the sphere of British influence, right, around the Atlantic. So you had England at the apex of the triangle, right? So in England, the ship would be loaded up, typically with manufactured goods. and also sometimes with weapons, right, with firearms. These manufactured goods would then be taken to West Africa to be sold in exchange for slaves, spices, and certain kinds of exotic lumber. Though usually uh, ships that were engaged specifically in slave trading tried to cram as many people as they could into the cargo hold. Um, I don't know if any of you saw the illustration in the textbook of what the inner decks of a slave ship looked like, how closely packed together uh, people were. And you know, the, the, the hold, because it wasn't at, the cargo holds weren't actually meant to hold people to begin with, um, the ceilings were very low, so people often could not sit upright and certainly could not stand. They said they had to stay in the vessels of the ship? Well, one of them said that. Uh-huh. Yeah. Had, like a real, like, closed-in part of the ship, though, the vessel population? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, they, yeah they, they had no access to the decks or to fresh air. Um, uh, in fact, like, generally, they would only have access to fresh air if something had gone wrong, like the what happened to the Zong incident in uh, <coughs> Clarkson's narrative, right? Um, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, the Zong incident was a real kind of galvanizing moment uh, for British abolitionists. So then the ship would go from West Africa with this cargo to North America, or to the Americas, really. where it would pick up rum, sugar, and, to, and or tobacco, and then back to England to complete the cycle, right? And start over again. And you know, it was not uncommon for British captains who were engaged in other forms of trade 
to also trade slaves, right? Um, much of the British shipping of this period was engaged, um, if not wholly in slave, tra slave trading, at least in part in slave trading. And for the most part, this doesn't seem to have touched the consciences of British people until about the 1770s, right? This goes on largely unremarked in British society um, for most of the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries. And it's really only in, say, maybe the 1760s that this really, um, that awareness of slavery becomes a bigger deal in British public life, right? Now, some of this has to do with the emergence of that public sphere that we talked about last time, right? The fact that there, there are printing presses, there are newspapers, uh, more people are literate, more people are able to participate in public debate. There are public gathering places where people can come to talk about political issues and things like that, right? Um, there's also the presence of black Britons. Now, we tend to think of British culture as being predominantly or entirely white, but this is really um, a misapprehension, right? We don't really, um, it's never really been as monolithically white as people tend to think it is. For one thing, we have to remember that Britain was part of the Roman Empire, right? Which encompassed much of Western Asia and North Africa, right? So there would have been, even in ancient Britain, people, like, uh, uh, people from other parts of the world. Not only that, like Britain's dominance of trade internationally in the 17th and 18th centuries also meant that there were plenty of foreigners living in England, not to mention that there were a number of, uh, indeed, as it turned out, literate slaves living in Britain in these periods, right? Um, and it's many of these black Britons, people like Ola Uda Equiano, who we'll look at in more detail next time. And his contemporary, Ignatius Sancho, along with a few other people, who helped to uh, bring slavery into public consciousness, right? Now, one of the other things that's going on is an intellectual movement. So, a Scottish philosopher by the name of David Hume in the mid-18th century, I'm blanking on the exact year, writes a treatise on morality and the origins of morality in which he argues that our moral feelings come from sympathy. All right, that our desire to do good comes not from any internal impulse or from divine, com divine command or from you know, any sort of notion of religion. Rather, it comes from our ability to put ourselves in someone else's shoes. Right? That we can imagine, our, the fact that we're able to imagine ourselves in another person's position, right? So, say that I really, really want to get out that door and Valencia is in my way. What's the fastest way for me to get through that door if she's still standing there? 
Well, would going around her be the fastest? Those would be the polite ways to do it, right? What, what if I'm not worried about being polite? Yeah, just shove her over, right, and walk over her. Now, why don't I do that? Yeah, because I know it would hurt, right? I know that if somebody did that to me, it would be painful and embarrassing, right? And because I don't want to do that to her, because I can imagine what it would feel like, I don't. And instead, I say, excuse me, or I simply go around her, right? The, exam the specific example that Hume uses um, is, you know, it's like you're walking down the street, and you know, the fastest way for you to get to where you're going is to step on somebody else's gouty toes, but you don't because you know that if they did that to you, it would hurt, right? So we see in much of the literature of abolition in particular, um, attempts to put the reader into the shoes of, or into the situation of, the enslaved person. We see a lot of imaginary conversations, like Clarkson's here, um, with enslaved people. Um, we see a lot of attempts to bring, uh, bring home to people um, the horrors of slave labor, so they understand what conditions people are working under. Like, the idea is to try to touch their feelings, right? There's a whole genre that is not directly connected to abolition, abolitionism that rises out of Hume's philosophy um, that's called the literature of sentiment or of sensibility. Now this doesn't work for everybody who is involved in abolition. We see at the end of Coleridge's um, lecture, for example, that he doesn't think this actually works. He's critical of this. We'll go to that passage in a moment. But this is one of the primary tools that abolitionists start using um, to try to get their ideas across, right? This idea of trying to touch the feelings and the sympathy of the reader. Um, and they do actually manage to do a pretty good job, again, we'll look at this in more detail with Equiano next time, they do a pretty good job of, man of kind of bridging the gap, particularly between working class Britons and black Britons, at least temporarily. Now, one of the ironies of this is that Hume was actually a pretty uh, virulent racist. Um, who did not believe that black people felt the same things white people did or were the same kind of humans that, uh, that white people were. But his work, his ideas were used to promote the idea that fellow feeling should animate um, <clears throat> our social interactions, right? And that this was a way in to thinking about the plight of slaves in the West Indies, regardless of how much you liked sugar or how much you liked making money, right? Okay, so does anybody have any questions about any of this stuff? Yeah, Valencia. Can this be put in the paper for Friday? What's that? Can this be put in the paper for Friday? Yeah, I mean, the, 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 this, yeah, the, this, this is all like contextual stuff, right? So this shouldn't be the, the topic of, like the main topic of your paper should be one of the texts. But yeah, this is all stuff that you can include, yeah. In fact, it's often gonna be like when you're doing the, the response papers, you should probably start with a little bit of historical context, right? In your first paragraph, tell me, okay, so this is what's happening that the text is responding to or the like, text is involved in. Like the background, or well, like you said, like the background. Like the yeah, yeah, ex exactly. Yeah, what, what you're doing is providing context, right? And nothing means anything without context, right? Context always shapes meaning. So, 
Yeah, you can absolutely, yeah. This is the, the, the kind of thing you would start with, yeah. In fact, this is why I usually give this, this kind of thing to you at the beginning of class, right? And then we try to start applying it to uh, the text that we read. Um, any other questions? Where are we for time? Okay, we're fine for time. Okay. Do you bring in the wire too, and where do you, what kind of context do you find it from? Pardon? The wire? Um, I would worry more about the general historical context than anything specific about the writer. And I think the, re the reason for that is that we tend to think, probably because of the way we're taught in high school, that all writing is a form of autobiography. I would say, yeah, focus not so much on specific events in the writer's life, but rather like kind of the way the writer fits into a general historical context, right? So we're looking at that bigger, broader historical context rather than sort of like the, the lives of the great kind of thing, right? This is one of the reasons why, at least at the beginning here, we've actually been more focused on movements than we have been on individual authors, right? This is kind of the way I want us to be thinking um, throughout the course, right? We're thinking about these things as part of a contextual movement rather than as individual works of genius. Okay, other questions? Okay, then let's start digging into some of these texts. So let's turn to Thomas Clarkson uh, first. So Clarkson and Coleridge are both writing from an abolitionist perspective, right? But they're not taking quite the same tack. And in fact, I think that Coleridge would probably argue that Clarkson's way of doing things doesn't work. So let's look at first at Clarkson's um, imaginary conversation with an African. Um, so what did you guys make? Did you guys notice and like, like notice anything um, that you found weird or interesting in this piece? Was there anything surprising to you about it? Okay, if, if we look at what the, the situation described, and it's a fictional situation, right? Yeah. We've got, right, British man and a West African man, right, having a conversation in what is apparently some kind of coastal trading port, right? And Kyla, is the part you're referring to kind of like the part at the end of this section where he's talking about like surely if people knew in Britain what was going on, they would want to do something? Yeah, plus he was saying like he was just, you know, like how he was describing to them, they were just saying they were just watching it going on. That's what they were saying. Uh -huh. like okay, that, that, that everything seems kind of passive here, yeah. that no one seems to be actively doing anything to stop this. Okay. Yeah, um, what does Clarkson see approaching as, he's, as he meets this man? What's coming towards them? Okay. Yeah, he just sees a cloud of dust initially, right? It's from a distance. All right, there's this cloud of dust. Right, page 99, right, and first, I will turn my eyes to the cloud of dust that is before me. It seems to advance rapidly and accompanied with dismal shrieks and yellings to make the very air that is above it tremble as it rolls along. What can possibly be the cause? I will inquire of that melancholy African who is walking dejected upon the shore, whose eyes are steadfastly fixed on the approaching object, and whose heart, if I can judge from the appearance of his countenance, must be greatly agitated. So, 
it matters that Clarkson sees this cloud of dust from a distance. He doesn't see it for what it is, right? Because it's far away. Right, much like the perspective of the average British person on the triangular trade, or if you're not directly participating in it, it's something that's happening far away um, that you don't see directly touching your life. So you might be aware of a cloud of dust and noise somewhere far off, but you don't really know what that thing is. And so when it's explained to him, right, alas, says the unhappy African, the cloud that you see approaching rises from a train of wretched slaves. Note the cloud is approaching though, right? It's at a distance, but it's getting closer. All right. It's no longer so far away that it can be ignored. They are going to the ships behind you. They are destined for the English colonies, and if you will stay here for but a little time, you will see them pass. They arrived here about two days ago from the inland country. I saw the fleet come in, which had gone to fetch them, and upon looking into the different canoes, found them lying at the bottom, their hands and feet being tied together. As soon as they were landed, they were conveyed to the houses of the black traders, which you see at a little distance, where they were immediately oiled and fed and made up for sale. So what he's referring to here when he talks about the black traders? Slavery was part of the traditional culture of West Africa, but it didn't operate in quite the same way that um, slavery in European colonies did, right? Slaves were typically prisoners of war, and in many cultures could uh, be ransomed by their families or could more easily buy their freedom. Um, they were also not typically engaged in large-scale plantation farming operations. Um, <clears throat> However, once Portuguese traders started showing up on the Gold Coast of Africa um, in the early 16th century, they started buying slaves from local chieftains and kings and taking them off to their colonies in the New World, right, particularly uh, Brazil. And so, this actually incited a great deal of violence within West Africa as chieftains saw for, uh, a new source of income for themselves, right? So I can make war on this neighboring village, capture a bunch of people, sell them to the Portuguese or to the British, and make a ton of money, right? So <clears throat> there was some complicity um, particularly among the upper classes of West African society um, in the trade. And that's what's being referred to here, right? Um, you get actually, there's a really, it doesn't fit the period that we're looking at, but there's a novel, a short novel by Afro Ben called Orinoco. Um, in which um, a prince who on the Gold Coast, who is himself a slave trader, ends up being tricked and captured um, by a slave trader with whom he was doing business and carted off to British colonies in the New World. Um, so that is, you know, you know, if you have time on your own to look this up, it, um, it is, it's, it's, it's not long and it is, um, it's a good read that also gives a little bit of good background here. Um, okay, so. We see the cloud of dust far off. The African man tells him, okay, this is a, a train of wretched slaves coming to the ships. Um, and if we look a little bit further down, page 99, right? <clears throat> this man, resumes the African, has traveled a considerable way. He lived at a great distance from hence and had a large family from whom he was daily to, for whom he was daily to provide. And he went out one night to a neighboring spring to procure water for his thirsty children. He was kidnapped by two slave hunters who sold him in the morning for some, uh, to some country merchants for a bar of iron. 
These drove him with other slaves, procured almost in the same manner to the nearest market, where some of the traveling traders purchased him for a pistol. These handed him down to the fair, from whence the canoes fetched him. His wife and children have long been waiting for his return. But he is gone forever from their sight, and they must be now disconsolate, being certain by his delay that he must have fallen into the hands of the Christians. So on the one hand, we see here that the techniques of that literature of sentiment, right? We can imagine the situation of a husband and father taken away from his family. We can imagine the situation of the wife and children waiting for the return of someone who's never going to come back. And then something slightly unexpected happens at the end of the paragraph, right? When the African mentions that, you know, this man had the misfortune to fall into the hands of the Christians. Yeah, Alex. The, uh, the words in italics, is that something that the writer himself, like, did he write it in yeah, he would have intended for that to be in italics. And I mean, it's, yeah, it would, at least the, he would have had the printer put it into italics, yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, the Christians and heathens are put in italics. Like, usually, it's very common in 18th century writing for key words to be capitalized and put into italics, right? It's, you know, it's like the, the printer is telling you this is what's being emphasized, right? This is what you should be paying attention to. So we had, yeah, Christians and heathens are both capitalized in italics. That would be part of the original text. And now, as I have mentioned the name of Christians, a name by which the Europeans distinguish themselves from us, I could wish to be informed of the meaning which such an appellation may convey. They consider themselves as men, but us unfortunate Africans, whom they term heathens, as the beasts that serve us. But ah, how different is the fact what is Christianity but a system of murder and oppression? The cries and yells of the unfortunate people who are now soon to embark for the regions of servitude have already pierced my heart. Have you not heard me sigh while we have been talking? Do you not see the tears that now trickle down my cheeks? And yet these hardened Christians are unable to be moved at all. Nay, they will scourge them amidst their groans and even smile while they are torturing them to death. Happy, happy heathenism, which can detest the vices of Christianity and feel for the distresses of mankind. So what is the imaginary African here saying about his perspective of Christianity? What do Christians look like to him? They seem like they're like evil people. Yeah, he, his knowledge of Christians is that these are cruel oppressors who come into his country, steal people, and take them away, right? Well, that's actually part of the argument Clarkson's making, right? Is that to behave in this way and to call oneself Christian, yeah, well, they yeah exactly, is, is to move against the actual tenets of the religion, right? So for the African, from whose perspective this statement is uttered, right? Christian just, it seems to be a cultural designation, right? He doesn't know anything about what their religious doctrine is, but because of their behavior, he assumes that it must involve murder, theft, and oppression, right? You know, or maybe like they call themselves Christians to make it seem like they're doing good, or, you know. Well, but, okay, well, and I think from Clarkson's perspective, that's what's taking place here. From the perspective of the character, right? The character, again, like doesn't know anything about their doctrines, right? The character is just judging them by what he sees happening. And doing so very much in that language of sentiment, right? You know, can they not see my tears, right? Can they not hear our cries? Why do they behave thusly? And Clarkson responds, but, I reply, you are totally mistaken. Christianity is the most perfect and lovely of moral systems. It blesses even the hand of persecution itself and returns good for evil. 
But the people against whom you so justly declaim are not Christians, they are infidels, they are monsters, they are out of the common course of nature. Their countrymen at home are generous and brave. They support the sick, the lame, and the blind. They fly to the succor of the distressed. They have noble and stately buildings for the sole purpose of benevolence. They are, in short, of all nations, the most remarkable for humanity and justice. So what Clarkson is doing here is defending to the African critic of Christianity, right? No, this is what, this is what it really means, right? Although the defense of buildings seems a little strange, right? We have stately buildings for the purpose of benevolence. Um, he's saying, no, these people you see aren't really Christians, right? The people I know at home are brave and do care about other people, right? And do want to do good and to help. But why then, replies the honest African, do they suffer this? Why is Africa a scene of blood and desolation? Why are her children wrested from here to administer to the luxuries and greatness of those whom they never offended? And why are these dismal cries in vain? Alas, I reply again, can the cries and groans which the air now tremble, with which the air now trembles be heard across this extensive continent? Can the southern winds convey them to the ear of Britain? If they could reach the generous Englishman at home, they would pierce his heart, as they have already pierced your own. He would sympathize with you in your distress. He would be enraged at the conduct of his countrymen and resist their tyranny. But hear a shriek, unusually loud, accompanied with a dreadful rattling of chains, interrupted the discourse. Yeah, go ahead, Alex. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, no, that, that's exactly what's ever. The story is just supposed to be a kind of illustrative example, right? Yeah. And the Clarkson character here isn't necessarily Thomas Clarkson himself, right? He is here appearing as representative, uninformed Englishman, encountering this situation for the first time. And there's a good deal of naivety baked into the character, right? Which is then undercut by the actual events in the narrative. So on the one hand, like the characters, well, you know, if people, if people knew about this, in English, if we could hear these shrieks and cries, right? And then that statement is immediately interrupted by loud shrieks and the rattling of chains, right? And again, it's like, no, like, people do know about this, right? They can hear, and they're still not doing anything. Um, <clears throat> Attached to that also, right, you know, to, in, in terms of consistency of imagery, right, again, remember that the, the cloud of dust that is at a distance is getting closer, right? So that the representative naive Englishman can now see what it is. Right, it can't be ignored anymore. It's too close and it's too loud. Now, the other part of Clarkson's uh, narrative is caught up here in first describing the actual physical conditions on a slave ship, right? Which, you know, he says like, like a ship that would be about the size for six people to take a pleasure cruise um, on the Severn River is taken to the African coast, filled up with 60 people, and then taken to the New World, right? on top of the other sort of cramped conditions. And the notion of human beings as property is uh, very, is, uh, what do I want to say, is kind of made concrete by his description of this incident aboard a ship called the Zong. So the Zong incident to which he refers, and this is again something that is very much in the background of Equiano's narrative we're going to be reading for next time, too. So this took place in September 1781. Um, and essentially what happened was uh, the captain of a slave ship called the Zong worried about potential financial losses from the voyage, dumped most of the cargo of slaves overboard, as in 
push them off the ship to drown in order to collect in the insurance money. Yeah, go ahead, Kyla. So, yeah, like, I was going to ask you about what you just said. Like, I read that, too. I didn't get that. What did that, what did tossing them off the ship have to do with anything involved in their insurance? What did that have to do with Well, them? because they were property, not the regarded. People? Yeah, the people. Yeah, the, the, the people and the boat were regarded as property. Mm -hmm. And property can be insured. So because he didn't think he was going to make a profit on the voyage, he figured he could at least collect the insurance money on the cargo. And so that cargo, which consisted of human beings to be sold into slavery, was pushed overboard and left to drown. And this was not as, like, the Zong incident was really kind of the first incident like this that really came to public attention, in large part because the slave trader's explanations as to why he did it didn't add up. Um, it came to public attention as a property fraud case, basically. Um, you, know, for, you know, for example, as Clarkson notes, um, he claimed that he had to push them overboard because there wasn't enough water. And yet, you know, the day after he the day after he pushed the first group overboard, it rained, mm -hmm. and then he pushed the second group overboard anyway, right? For no reason. Yeah, yeah. So the fact that it could be proven that there was no no justification for doing this was what brought this to. Um, to public attention again, like initially again, like as a property fraud case rather than as um, you know a violation of human persons, yeah, right? If they was to find out he dumped those people on board, he definitely would have got whatever he was looking to get anyway, right? Or, you know. Yeah, yeah. As 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 long as long yeah, as long as he didn't get as long as he didn't get caught in fraud, he would get the insurance money, and he'd make money on the voyage. But wouldn't it be more? Well, and, and again, like this, this is um, the, the other thing we have to consider here, right? Is that murder is of is one person killing another person, right? The people he pushed overboard were not legally people. Legally, they were property. Yeah. So yeah, so the, yeah, this, this was not regarded as murder, um, and. I'm going to um, introduce a concept. Again, we're going to draw it a little bit more next time. Um, but it is something that's important for us to think about. There's a French anthropologist. Uh, his name is Claude Mayassou. I think I have spelled his last name correctly. Um, Mayassou um, has made a particular study of uh, slaveholding cultures. And he makes a distinction between what he calls the condition and the state of slavery. And he argues that people often get these two mixed up, right? The condition refers to the actual material conditions of the slave's existence. Right, how they're treated, whether they're treated cruelly or humanely, whether they're fed well enough, whether they're sheltered, given clothing, things like that, right? The state of slavery, on the other hand, refers to the legal status of a person as unfree. Right, essentially the legal status. Damn it. Of the slave as property. And the reason it's important not to mix these up is because we, we often get hung up on the treatment aspect of this while ignoring the fact that we're talking about people whose legal status is that of property, right? That ultimately it doesn't matter whether they're treated well if they're still treated as property, right? 
That's Mayasu's basic argument. So we've seen in Clarkson an argument largely from sensibility here, right? You know, this, this idea that you know, this should touch your feelings and you should want to be the kind of Christian that I describe here rather than the kind who brutally oppresses people. Um, now, if we look at William Cobbett's piece on page 118, on his, William Cobbett's essay in defense of the slave trade, what are Cobbett's arguments largely proceeding from? What does he base most of his arguments on? Yeah, go ahead. Um, this, um, um, he didn't he say like he believed that the slavery was something that God wanted, or was that someone else? Yeah, you're, 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 yeah, you've got the right, the, the right one here. Yeah, so so he's arguing largely from the point of view of script. He's making scriptural arguments, right? And this was a very common tactic um, among defenders of slavery. Pardon? Yeah, yeah, in some ways, yeah, uh, what Cobbett is doing is confirming the opinion of the imaginary African, right? So these scriptural arguments um, are again, but they're not based typically on doctrine. Right. There is nothing in the Ten Commandments or in the Gospels that says thou shalt be allowed to own slaves, right? Rather, what they're doing is inferring from the fact that certain biblical patriarchs did own slaves, the idea that you know, God doesn't have any problem with people doing so, right? So because, right, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob owned slaves, it must be okay. Right, never mind that they're talking about, you know, narratives that were composed by nomadic herds people 2,000 years ago, right? and that the culture that they're talking about is very, very different. Um, there was also a belief that was pretty common among scriptural, um, Cobbett doesn't mention it specifically, but there was a belief that was pretty common among scriptural defenders of slavery uh, called polygenesis. And this was the idea that people of different races were created by God in different places at different times, and that only white people were descended from Adam and Eve. Now, remember, so we're talking about a kind of pre-Darwinian uh, historical paradigm here, right? So you know, we don't have Darwin's theory of evolution yet. Um, the only real going theory in Europe at the time is the notion of you know, God having created the world in seven days some six and a half thousand years ago, right? Um, and one of the ways that people like Cobbett often justified treating black, uh, black people, Africans, as different or as inferior was subscribing to the notion that they weren't created, that they were part of a lesser creation, right? that happened in a different place after the fact. Now the other thing that Cobbett is doing here, um, if we look on page 118, it may have hitherto escaped your lordship's attention that the present attack on the property and reputation of the West India planters and the African merchants 
originates from the same set of people who, 150 years ago, voted peers and bishops to be useless. Do you think, my lord, these people have so far changed their principles as not to have as strong an inclination as formerly to bind kings in chains and nobles in links of iron? Can you, my lord, suppose these people less capable of injuring your lordships than they were in the middle of the last century because they have for their allies the philosophers, the illuminers, the atheists, and the Jacobins of France? What these people have been capable of, they have already shown you. They have availed themselves of the mistaken zeal of Mr. Wilberforce, the Humane Society, and the Old Jewry, and their missionary, the Reverend Mr. Clarkson, in preaching the doctrines of liberty and equality to the Negroes. Now, what is Cobbett trying to raise the specter of here? Yeah? It sounds like he's trying to say, like, the same people who are saying these things, they, they aren't as good themselves, basically. Yeah, when he refers to what happened 150 years ago, what he's talking about is the English Civil War. Now, does anybody remember, we talked about this a little bit, what happened during the English Civil War, what that was? This was when a faction of Parliament led by the Puritan lawmaker Oliver Cromwell deposed and executed the king, right? And for a while, England was then ruled as a protectorate with Cromwell at the head rather than as a kingdom, right? So because it's these dissenting traditions of which the Puritans would have been one, though they no longer existed by 1802, um, that are most associated with the abolition movement, right? these groups that are outside the Church of England. Cobbett is arguing that the same people that were responsible for that anarchy 150 years ago are the ones who are trying to destroy the slave trade now, right? So because these people were not on the side of the king 150 years ago, they're the same people who want to supplant all royal authority now. So he's arguing that, the, that a threat to the slave trade is a threat to the authority of the king and of the church, right? So he's tying all of these things up together. Um, it's, um, a, it is a wild and crazy blend of reactionary paranoia, right? Um, okay, so that is about all the time we have, so we're going to stop there. Uh, we might talk about Coleridge a little bit next time. Um, but we will definitely be spending most of the period on Equiano and Prince. Um, and <clears throat> let's just get started cleaning up.